Okay, I'm going to, I'm Michael Bordo, I'm going to uh, moderate this session. Um, before we start, I'd like to just throw out a few uh, background comments which I think are relevant to the issues of this panel and, and, and this meeting. Um, so the first point I want to make is that if we look through the history of the Federal Reserve, um, you, you will see that with only a few exceptions, maybe in the 1950s and a couple other times, the Fed has mistimed its monetary policy actions. It uh, often tightens too late and loosens too soon. And uh, Friedman, Milton Friedman, wrote a paper way back, like in the 50s, that made this point. And he's made it quite often. Uh, there's a new book coming out by Ed Nelson, which sort of documents Friedman's views. And so this is a, a, a per, was a perennial in his view. And I've done research uh, with colleague, my colleague at Rutgers that basically backs up, uh, backs up Friedman. So the question is, how has this changed? Um, I mean, in a sense, the, the basic idea that comes out of this, without getting into all the intricacies of monetary theory, is that the Fed should tighten at the point before the business cycle peaks. That's what countercyclical monetary policy is about. But as things are going, it's probably going to end up, it'll probably be too late. They either won't tighten, we'll have a recession, or they'll tighten, and the timing will be wrong. And we'll all, what will happen is inflation will already start picking up. And there is evidence uh, here and there, especially with the measures coming out of the Cleveland Fed, that we already have inflation. So, we, so what's going to happen is then we do tighten and we create a recession. So I would say the chances are pretty good. The timing uh, is going gonna, is gonna to be wrong. Um, my last point that I want to make um, is about this discussion about the natural interest rate the real uh, natural rate uh, being close to zero, which comes out of empirical work uh, done by people like John Williams uh, in San Francisco. And, and I think it's sort of been taken over by, the, by all the Fed people on everybody. Um, and it's largely explained by recent experience. I mean, all the empirics comes from the last 20 years, maybe, OK? If you, Again, taking an historical perspective, which I like to do, if you look at the evidence on the, on the real interest rates going back through the 20th century, you'll see there's a lot of fluctuation. You see there are periods like the 1920s and the 30s where they're really low and other periods when they're really high. And if you, if you in a sense, you know, fit a trend line through the 20th century, and maybe that's too long and people say, wow, you're bringing in all these you know, huge events, World War II, et cetera. Okay, you're going to end up with a with a, with a, a real interest rate that's probably close to the real growth rate of the economy. I don't believe the real growth rate in the long run in the U.S. economy is down to zero. I mean, maybe it's two to two and a half percent. So that's why I'm very skeptical of this. With these comments, I turn this over to Marvin. Um, we're going to have we only have two two uh, speakers, so Marvin's going to talk for 15 minutes or so. Then we can have Q&A, and then it'll be Athanasios. Thank you. Uh, so th thanks, Mike. Uh, before I start, I want to say that we're very pleased today to have uh, Ms. Loretta Mester as our uh, guest speaker, I think sometime around noon. Uh, and, but before that, we'll have a pa two panels of SOMC members to talk about some issues of more general nature in the transmission of monetary policy and um, robustness of monetary policy in the future. So with that um, introduction, let me begin my own presentation. My part of the SOMC policy discussion uh, this morning is going to present in brief a paper that I presented recently at the Jackson Hole Symposium uh, put on by the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank. And this is, this, these remarks are basically about being prepared for the future. And I want you to think about this. It's not that I'm going to, what I'm about to say is uh, being proposed to be used imminently. I'm going to make a case for unencumbering interest rate policy at the zero interest bound. Um, one of the reasons I think that's important is I think we have independent central banks to be prepared and not be presumptuous. Be prepared and not be presumptuous. Don't be afraid of talking about things that might be frightening to the public years in advance. And, in, and with that tr in mind, I'm going to do some of that right now. 
So much has changed since my exploration of negative interest rate policy in a 1999 Federal Reserve System conference called Monetary Policy in a Low Inflation Environment. Since then, negative nominal rate policy has gone from a theoretical possibility to practical reality in much of the advanced world. And in light of these developments, my current paper, the one I'm uh, briefly summarizing here, makes the case for unencumbering interest rate policy altogether so that negative nominal rates can be made freely available and fully effective as a realistic policy option in a future crisis. Let me see, try to make that, that point. Uh, in some detail. First and foremost, for me, the zero interest balance should be removed much as the gold standard and fixed foreign exchange rates were removed in the, in the 20th century. They were removed to free the general price level from the influence of relative prices over which the central bank had little control. We all remember, well, I don't know if we remember the gold standard. Some, some of you may. Um, that you know, the gold standard was an encumbrance on monetary policy in the sense that the gold price of goods over which central banks had very little control was pushing around the general price level all around the world. It took a long time for us to unencumber ourselves from that relative price. Later on and kind of mixed up with the end of the gold standard was the idea that the international terms of trade, the real price of goods between one country and the other was encumbering a monetary policy when that policy was fixing the exchange rate of one money to another. And so one of the reasons that the advanced economies got rid of the fixed exchange rate was to unencumber monetary policies from the relative price of goods over which, again, central banks had little control. So likewise, the, in my view, the zero interest bound encumbrance is to be removed so that movements in the intertemporal terms of trade can be reflected fully in interest rate policy to stabilize employment and inflation with a minimum of potentially inefficient and costly alternative policies. The reason I'm bringing up minimum of alternative policies is because as long as we remain encumbered at zero, should it become a more serious encumbrance in the future, then what happened the last time is other policies will be introduced to overcome that encumbrance, which in my view are much worse than dealing with that encumbrance directly. That's an, in a nutshell what, what I want to tell you in the next 15 minutes. Now, I use a simple model in this paper to explain the idea. The idea is very straightforward. By lending instead of consuming, a household can exchange one unit of current consumption for one plus R units of future consumption, where R is the real interest rate, and the intertemporal terms of trade is one plus R. I give up one apple today, I get one plus R apples in the future. I'm trading current for future consumption. So a higher R means a more favorable intertemporal terms of trade, and when that happens, households plan lifetime consumption so that the present discounted value of, margin, of, of consumption, I, don't want to, I should stay away from the jargon, households plan their lifetime consumption to maximize their lifetime utility, given the intertemporal terms of trade. So roughly speaking, the natural interest rate that Mike had talked about briefly is the interest rate that makes desired lifetime consumption plans conform to present and expected future potential output where potential output is nothing more than the level of available consumption in aggregate that sustains full employment and stable general prices. That's all the natural rate is. Now, current and future potential output depend in turn on productivity per hour, where it's going in the future relative to the present, and also on hours worked, where they're going in the future relative to the present. So in the end, the interest rate, the intertemporal terms of trade is going to depend on the rate of time preference, productivity growth, and expected growth of potential hours worked. Let me explain. The most relevant case today is the low interest rate pessimistic equilibrium. If households foresee little productivity growth and expect future hours worked to decline relative to current hours worked, I'm talking here about the participation rate, not necessarily the unemployment rate. So some of what I'm going to say is a little bit divorced from the current policy discussion. If households foresee a more pessimistic future relative to the present, then households will try to move their consumption to the future where it's going to be more valuable at the margin. This is apparently what's happening all around the advanced world, which is why interest rates have been coming down in real terms for the past 20 years. The problem is, in aggregate, such pessimistic beliefs will drive down the intertemporal terms of trade and the natural interest rate low enough to deter households from wanting to lend 
to clear the credit and goods markets and make households content with a pessimistic lifetime plan. Now, the problem with the zero bound is, without going into the details, we're all familiar with this, monetary policy may not be able to push the real interest rate low enough to shadow the underlying natural rate that's consistent with households spending enough today to maintain stable prices against gentle deflation and full employment. So around the world, I would say, there's a plausible pessimism at work. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this plausible pessimism has been depressing the intertemporal terms of trade and the natural interest rate for some time. In my view, um, the most plausible reason why this is happening has to do with the fact that there has been a large and growing overhang relative to GDP built up in the United States and around the world in recent decades of public debt and mandatory government spending on social security, health care, pensions, and other transfers that's essentially, in a global context, unprecedented. In other words, I think our political economy is becoming stressed out for a bunch of reasons, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, that's caused our, our countries to overcommit uh, to future spending. Now, why is that a problem? Because when people who have the wherewithal to spend today are looking at the future, they're thinking, well, the future is likely to be less bright than the present. Why? Because I'm in the crosshairs of higher future taxes. So what does that mean for the real interest rate? Households with the wherewithal to spend, with the wherewithal to move consumption between periods, have tended to move consumption to the future, or at least to try to do so, with the effect of depressing the intertemporal terms of trade. Excuse me. Now, you might think, well, firms would take advantage of this. And a lot of pundits are saying, well, you know, the government should take advantage of this. Well, if government spending commitments in the future are the cause of the de depressed real interest rate in the first place, it makes no sense to argue for government spending today to be financed by future debt or future taxes. I'm not going to talk about individuals, but there are many individuals who are making this argument. And the reason they make the argument is because they miss the premise that I've been taking the last two or three minutes to explain. In my view, it would be a mistake to try to fix this problem, to, create, to raise real interest rates by having the government do more spending against future taxes. Because the very group that's pushing interest rates down would then save more in the future where they expect to be even more in the crosshairs of future taxes. Now, there are also disparate developments around the world that feed into this scenario. Let me just list a few. First, rising income inequality within the world is creating political economy that's much more conducive to transfers. In other words, the very fact that income is being, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. I can, I can tell you what the flu is like this season if you want to know later. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so, so what you have here is, I, I, I have something. What you, what you have is a, a situation, in large part, where income inequality is putting more wealth in concentrated parts of our countries than ever before. So therefore, this part of the income distribution sees itself in future in the crosshairs of future taxes. And the political economy in democratic capitalism is naturally taking account of this and creating more transfers with good, good intentions to help um, um, people who haven't done very well with, with, um, with the globalization. Secondly, falling population growth around the world means slower expansion or outright contraction of future hours worked to support all these programs that the government wants to support. Third, global GDP is increasingly made up of output from less developed countries with less secure property rights, less stable politics, and less security in old age. Fourth, waning support for liberalization of international trade, whatever you think about this, portends a slowing, if not a loss, of the gains from trade. That's a future that's less productive than the present. Fifth, productivity growth has been slowing throughout the developed world, and productivity growth has been slowing in the emerging world since the, recess, the great turmoil. And sixth, I think what's also at work here is that there's a looming downside risk in the mind of the public due to, and here's a word I really like, incapacitation of monetary and fiscal policy so that we're at the zero bound. If the public thinks that the, the, the governments of the world, for reasons I don't really want to get into, are 
unable to act in the next downturn, people are going to save a little bit more. It was a precautionary demand. Now, those are the um, overarching points of view I want to make, but the evidence is clear. For the last two decades, the global real indexed bond rates, let's say 10 years out, have fallen from an average of around 4% in the mid-1990s to zero today. That's an, a precipitous decline in the real interest rate at the 10-year horizon. Mike may have evidence that that's happened before, but, but I'm not aware of it. In any case, that's where we are today. The problem for monetary stabilization policy, and this is the crux of my argument, is that the precipitous decline in long-term nominal interest rates, remember the nominal component has been stable because we have relatively stable inflation. The precipitous decline in long-term nominal rates leaves little leeway for the usual cyclical decline of short-term nominal rates below the long-term nominal rate in the recovery from recessions. That is to say, in every one of the eight recessions in the United States, for instance, since 1960, the yield curve has tilted upward sharply because the short rate has come down far below the long-term rate in the recoveries from these recessions. For example, the Fed pushed the federal funds rate more than 2.5 percentage points below the 10-year nominal rate in all eight cases. And in five of those cases, the Fed pushed the, the federal funds rate 3.5 percentage points below the long-term 10-year bond rate. Um, during the recovery phases. The issue for me is, what are we going to do if we get a recession on the next couple of years and we're not fortunate enough to get a recovery going that pushes up the real interest rate? I started out, be prepared, not be presumptuous. Now, the, the problem is, it would be possible to imagine the federal funds rate being pushed down by the requisite amount, even if the 10-year rate was at 1.5%. It's now a little bit higher. If that were true, then the, then the federal funds rate would be pushed to minus 1% or even minus 2% to match the 3.5 percentage point decline in these previous uh, recessions I was describing. But it's questionable whether such persistently negative nominal interest rates would be feasible in the face of current institutional arrangements which freely accommodate the demand for currency, for paper currency, at par with deposits. And here we get to an, an analogous issue what I started with. The gold standard fixed the dollar price of gold. The fixed exchange rate fixed the dollar price of foreign exchange. And we're fixing the dollar price, of the, 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 the deposit price of paper currency. These are analogous impediments on monetary policy, which I think it would be wise for us to recognize and maybe decide how to deal with it. Now, balance sheet policy is not the answer either. Uh, and it's important for me to make this case because apparently a lot of central banks think it is. <laughs> Pressure to rely more heavily on balance sheet policy in lieu of interest rate policy will tempt central banks increasingly to exert stimulus via essentially fiscal policy initiatives. Bluntly put, the monetary funding of credit to the private sector, the monetary funding of a bond market carry trade, and the monetary funding of the public debt. I don't like the words unconventional policies. I don't even like the words balance sheet policy. I like saying what it is. These are fiscal monetary funding of various uh, objectives. Now, the point I want to make is that general purpose stabilization policy is best suited for interest rate policy. I'm, I'm a person that's open-minded to balance sheet policy in a financial crisis. But I'm not a person that thinks that, oh, that, financial, that the balance sheet policy is it all appropriate for general purpose stabilization? And that's one of the main reasons why I'm making the case for unencumbering the zero bound, so we can use interest rate policy rather than um, balance sheet policy in the next recession, especially if the 10-year nominal bond rates don't move very much above where they are now. Now, to bring this, this talk to, to, to a conclusion and talk a little about the mechanics of all this, the long-standing commitment by central banks to accommodate the deposit demand for paper currency at par limits the scope for negative nominal interest rate policy. This is no surprise. People are, are used to this argument by now. Under current arrangements, a deeply negative, sustained nominal interest rate policy would precipitate what I would call a dangerous disintermediation of banks and money markets, essentially financed by the central bank's own provision of paper currency at par with deposits. The analogy with the fixed exchange rate or the gold standards is pretty close, in my view. 
Negative interest rate policies pursued around the world today demonstrate that the cost of handling, storing, or insuring paper currency and the greater versatility of deposits <coughs> for transactions, they create some leeway for policy to push nominal rates below zero without encouraging a run from deposits into paper currency or from money markets into paper currency. We've seen that. Moreover, central banks can raise the cost of exercising the currency option by discontinuing the issuance of large denomination bills or charging banks and the public a little bit more whenever paper currency is requested. But an important point that I want to make is this. The central banks that do this, and I believe this will happen, they'll try to make it a little more costly for people to obtain currency to avoid the disintermediation. At that point, you can imagine somewhere in the, the advanced world, somebody puts paper currency for sale on eBay. Central banks cannot control the relative price of paper currency and deposits by preventing people from getting currency on par with deposits. And when I, whenever I say this, my hair kind of stands up on my neck when I can foresee what might happen. Again, we've been there. The gold standard, fixed exchange rates. Now we have another encumbrance. Um, so I think it behooves central banks to think about this ahead of time. The zero bound encumbrance on interest rate policy could be eliminated completely and expeditiously by discontinuing the central bank's defense of the par deposit price of paper currency. I'm not arguing to do this immediately. I'm arguing to be prepared to do it eventually because balance sheet policy is a dead end. And let me just complete, conclude with a couple of points. You might wonder, well, how would this work? What we have is essentially a situation where we might have two monies, deposits and paper currency, with a floating exchange rate between them, where one is paying zero interest and the other pays negative interest. We've seen that world. It's called the world of international exchange rate determination, where countries have different interest rates and the exchange rate adjusts to, make, to equilibrate the national monies in the international foreign exchange markets. But I want to leave you with an even more relevant um, piece of data. The flexible deposit price of paper currency would behave much like it actually did when the payment of currency for deposits was restricted in the United States during the banking crises of 1873, 1893, and 1907. And I'll conclude with a quote from Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's famous book, where they comment on how that worked. Of course. So they report that market-determined flexibility in the deposit price of currency worked reasonably well in those episodes, especially after the, under the circumstances. And they wrote, the 1907 restriction involved the refusal of banks to convert deposits into currency at the demand of the depositor. It did not involve on any large scale even the temporary closing of banks or the secession of their financial operations, let alone the permanent failure of any substantial number. It lasted for several months, and once adjustment was made to the use of two only partly convertible media of payment, currency and deposits could have continued for a much longer period, as in some earlier episodes, without producing an economic breakdown, and indeed could have continued in conjunction with economic revival. <laughs> Under the circumstances, they regard that, uh, those experiences as workable. What I'm saying here is we too should regard that sort of thing as workable in a future crisis and think about it, um, and uh, in my conclu the concluding part of my paper, what I point out is this. If we did uh, unencumber interest rates at the zero bound in, in an emergency, inflation could be credibly controlled, the public could safely hold longer term nominal bonds free of inflation risk, and thereby minimize its exposure to negative short term interest rates. So we can imagine a mutually reinforcing equilibrium in which the public uh, extends the maturity of its savings and the central bank with the public support feels free to pursue negative nominal interest rates policy on occasion to perpetuate full employment and price stability. The idea of negative nominal interest rates takes some getting used to, but the alternatives are much worse in my opinion and we as People who think deeply about monetary policy need to put this on the table as an option for um, monetary policy should we get a recession before we have the good fortune of having nominal interest rates at the 10-year horizon move much above where they are now. The public would get 
more secure employment, and more secure price stability, more security and lifetime savings. And I, I leave you with this. I urge you to think about this as an option um, rather than think about balance sheet policy as a panacea. And you may notice I didn't talk at all about the inflation target. Um, I'm happy to take questions about it. Leave you with a couple of my, my thoughts about inflation are inflation is financial anarchy. It's Resort to higher inflation to get away from this problem to me is sort of the equivalent of appeasement in international affairs. Uh, and I'm, I'll take any questions you want to uh, ask me on that. Thank you. Sure. You can pick people. What should we say to people, or what do you think, uh, uh, how would you respond to people who say we should wait until inflation kicks up before raising rates, and when would you choose to raise rates uh, before the traditional measures of inflation kick up? Um, so I'm, I'm glad Diana asked me this question. I've been talking mainly about the, the, the pre being prepared should interest rates have to go below zero, and that's an entirely separate issue from what I believe about current monetary policy. Current monetary policy, it seems to me, should should take account of the fact that waiting too long, as Mike Bordo said, to raise rates against inflation um, would be a mistake. Uh, if only to show that the Federal Reserve is concerned about inflation, it should raise rates a little bit this year and next year. To not do so suggests to the public that the Federal Reserve is not concerned about inflation rising above 2 percent. And to me, that signals to firms and workers out there, you're on your own. We have essentially financial anarchy and the Fed is going to wait till that anarchy rears its head before it raises rates. Makes no sense to me. One of the reasons the Fed will not raise rates, by the way, today is because it's afraid that doing so, it might have to reverse field and be unable to go below zero against recession. That to me is probably, uh, if not the first, one of the very top reasons why the Fed is likely to make the mistake and not move rates up. So it ties back to this issue I'm talking about. But I agree that rates should rise today because the idea is to stabilize the purchasing power of money against relative price changes, which otherwise would uh, destabilize employment and inflation. Uh, hi. Have you thought about the lower bound of negative nominal? Who's, who's talking? Yeah. Have you thought about a lower bound for negative nominal interest rates, namely as being equal to the amortized cost of renting a vault and protecting it? Renting a home? Renting a vault. A vault. Oh, a yeah. vault yes. and protecting yes. it with a security force. Um, so the amortized cost yeah. of that would be, let's say, no more than negative 50 basis points. So as the lower bound of negative yeah, I think nominal interest. Rate. Yes, I mean, to if in under current arrangements, the lower bound will be governed by the cost of get obtaining currency, as I understand your comment, and storing it because that would add to the storage cost. And essentially, the storage cost is what's causing the, uh, determining the lower bound. Um, so, and I don't really know where that is, um, but there's, there's a lot of work on that. In addition to the factors that you mentioned for the decline in the uh, real interest rate, would you consider an additional factor being that the income distribution towards the upper groups who are not going to consume as much means that they would be saving, and the poor prospects for the future that are causing this, also create a poor outlook for returns, which means that even though interest rates are low, the expected returns are discouraging investment, so that you have more of a problem. In addition to which, if you look at money as a portfolio decision to hold money as a portfolio decision, one of the factors that should influence it is the percentage of total assets that one has. So that instead of inflation just appearing in goods and services, not at the creation could result in an effort to buy more financial and other assets, driving up their prices in an inflationary manner above what normally would be considered their fundamental values as a factor in causing the low real rate. Uh, I, I, if I understand your question, I think, yes, there's a connection between the forces that are driving the, 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 the intertemporal terms of trade down and elevated asset prices, because people are trying to run and find uh, higher returns, and in so doing, driving the real returns on other assets 
negative, essentially asset, another way of saying asset prices are too high to be justified by economic returns. I think, and, and that's the sense in which the, 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 the problem of low neg negative interest or low real interest rates is compounded by higher asset prices which are, they look uns unsustainable, if that's what you're saying. I agree with that. That's part of the problem. But I want to point out that the problems, these, all these problems lie elsewhere besides monetary policy. They're all being driven by, in my view, various aspects of the political economy and the circumstances that the global economy is in today. Uh, maybe I'm showing my age here, but why don't you think the uh, Fed has kind of embraced digital currencies, you know, to kind of help with negative interest rates? Uh, they don't want to talk about negative interest rates at all, uh, let alone potential solutions. If you read the, the general paper that, I'm, that I wrote for Jackson Hole, there's a long section about uh, electronic currency. And I believe that if we were to fast forward in some time machine by 300 years, that's exactly what we would have. Instead of paper liability currency by central banks, we would all be having more or less direct electronic currency at the central banks, and we'll get past this problem. But it would be a shame if this problem tanked the global economy in the meantime and created all kinds of turmoil when it was just a monetary problem and nothing. Uh, uh, it would, would exacerbate the real problems we have. Yeah, I, I have trouble seeing out here. So the light is right in my eyes, so you have to point out if. Could you explain? Yeah. Uh, Janet Yellen adopted global interdependence in her February Economic Club speech. The Bank of Japan has dominated monetary policy throughout 2016, in terms of the U.S. as well. You know, to the question of financial anarchy or to the question of global central bank interdependence. Um, how does all of your views with regard to uh, interest rates at this point domestically relate to that? My, my own feeling is that the balance sheet alternative to old-fashioned interest rate policy is much more um, uh, responsible for negative spillovers across countries with respect to monetary policy. And I think that's what's happened. I mean, the, these, these, these huge balance sheet policies that central banks are using in lieu of interest rate policy have created lots of inter, international turmoil and have lost central banks' room scope for independent action. Uh, and that's awesome. Mike is telling me I, I should. Anne Marie originally said. Oh, okay. Anne Marie. Hi. I, I'm, I'm struggling, but. Uh, the whole notion that the monetary policy almost is responsible, the balance sheet policy is almost responsible for the anarchy is, I mean. Oh, I didn't mean no, that. Okay. Uh, it struck me that it's, n that if you're expecting higher taxes in the future, you would, the normal reaction would be, to spend more now, spend your wealth down so that it won't get taxed. <laughs> yeah, <that's> and, <laughs> and so I'm trying to flip this and I'm yeah, having I, trouble. I hope that's not your normal reaction. I mean, well, we, we can, I, I give you, I'm maybe, not a, maybe there's an age-related thing here, but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, why? So in other words, because you're going to be taxed in the future, you'll have less consumption and a higher marginal utility of consumption, you'll, you'll spend today to the point where you have a very low marginal utility of consumption today. Uh, the, the, the idea in this sort of intertemporal trading well, model is you do the opposite. Well, normally, you would spend on something that, the government, that you think the government will tax less. For well, instance, you buy a fancier home, you... Uh, yes, okay, now that is equivalent to what we were talking about before. You essentially buy... You'd invest in something like a house, trying to carry your wealth to the future. Yeah. But in that, but in the house's case, it's carrying your wealth to the future by giving you direct pecuniary services. But in so doing, you'll raise the price of houses to the point where the the, the, the effect is sort of a negative real interest rate, like you have elsewhere in the economy. So yes, that's that's that makes. I'll, I'll vouch for that. That right. makes sense. I'm doing that myself. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, but but in in, in general, you, what you're normally we think of you. Spend now because you're worried about inflation, and in the 
I mean, that's... This is a different thing. This is, it's, you'll sp not spend now because you're worried about taxes in the future, and you've got to somehow save enough to avoid that, or, or to uh, have enough to pay those taxes and still have enough to live comfortably. It's yeah, the I logic. Prefer, yeah, but, right, that's you the know, idea. the alternative right. strategy is to find a way to put your wealth in a place that it won't get taxed in the future. You're going okay. to that's guess at relevant, uh, relative tax policy. And that's part of it, but the only way you can move your, the only way the, the advanced, the global economy or the aggregate economy can move wealth to the future is by building something that has, like capital goods, that actually moves to the future. You can't lend it to somebody else. And so exactly the thinking you just mentioned is what's driving up asset prices that look like they're free of taxation to get your money to the future for the reason that I'm saying. So that part I, I, I sign on to, yeah. Okay. I'm stop now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Our, sec our second paper is Athanasios Orphanides. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm going to warn you all, I will not talk about anarchy. I will not talk about uh, uh, what the uh, financial world is going to look like in 300 years uh, when the idea of the big brother uh, in Washington, D.C., where we all have our accounts with the central bank and cannot use anything else for, let's not talk about that. Uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will sound much more traditional and talk about conventional issues. And, um, and take the other side in some, uh, in some sense from what, uh, uh, from what Marvin just described. Um, um, I'm going to start by highlighting the topic of, the, uh, 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 of uh, today's workshop uh, and, and the session. Uh, rethinking monetary policy amid uncertainty. And I think, of course, uncertainty is, uh, uh, is effectively uh, the uh, uh, constant characteristic of, of monetary policy. The, um, um, uh, the problem I think we have in, in monetary economics and in how central banks behave is that uh, from time to time, uh, the presence of uncertainty and its implications are underemphasized. So we go through these cycles where uh, people get uh, overconfidence. Ah, don't worry about this. You know, we can calibrate everything. We know, you know, 37 and a half basis points move. It's going to just fix everything up or down. And then from time to time, we get into these cycles uh, where we realize, oh, hmm, we don't know as much as we thought we did. Uh, how do we react on economy after the 2007-2008 uh, 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 crisis? Hmm, the employment rate went up to 10%. I thought the macroeconomists were teaching that we solved that problem. This wasn't supposed to happen again. Oh, interest rates are down to zero? What do you mean? What do we do? So we have these uncertainties that have always been with us. But uh, in the last few years, we are in a stage where we are uh, relearning how important uh, they are. And for the session in particular, the, um, uh, the two issues that are relevant and for which uh, Marvin is, 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 is very correct, we need to think through about how to be dealing with, this, with, this, uh, with these issues forward is how do we act when um, nominal interest rates are uh, around zero for a long time. Uh, this is something that 10 years ago, uh, people around the world doing work on this in the Federal Reserve System and elsewhere will say, well, yeah, we can actually go to zero rates, but probably 5%, uh, 10% uh, of the time at most, uh, brief periods, a few quarters, and then we get out of it. And of course, we see that that's not the experience we are living through. So how do we deal with situations where the, uh, the tool that before the crisis we thought that was the primary tool for monetary policy is kind of stuck? One answer is uh, create more room by changing the financial uh, architecture so that the rates can go uh, negative. I think this should be examined, but uh, it's not available right now and it's not gonna be available in the near future uh, at all. The other element that is related is uh, the uh, so-called natural real rate. I mean, why are nominal rates uh, close to zero? 
And why is the term structure of interest rate so flat? Uh, because the underlying uh, real interest rate that, uh, that the economy uh, needs to operate to, uh, to be at around full employment so that you don't have inflationary forces, you don't have deflationary forces, seems to be considerably lower now than was uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And this is where we have seen the trend, uh, uh, both Marvin and Mike uh, have, have mentioned this, um, estimates of uh, uh, the R star concept, this short term Fed funds equivalent uh, real rate, uh, they used to be, uh, 15 years ago, they used to be 2.5%. Uh, and, and now uh, um, a lot of people at the Fed are telling us uh, around zero. And some people outside the Fed are telling us minus uh, something. So that's a huge difference. 2.5 percentage points in these things is, uh, uh, is, is quite big. At the same time, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, um, and this is, this is something I want to stress, I think the mistake we were making, uh, the consensus mistake we were, we were making before the crisis, is in fooling ourselves that uh, these natural rates uh, uh, are not varying that much uh, and that we know how to estimate them very well. I think that was a mistake uh, all along. I think, uh, and I think the, uh, the alternative uh, mechanism we should be, we should be uh, 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 thinking about is uh, how to formulate systematic monetary policy, recognizing that uh, the natural rate of interest may be moving uh, in, in an un uncertain way, and from time to time, as it is right now, may be so low that we cannot really use the... Uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the short term uh, interest rate as a policy instrument to stabilize the economy. That's the context I want to address, and I want to address two specific questions um, that uh, implicitly um, will relate also to current policy. The first question is Does the, does the zero lower bound uh, limit monetary policy? We know the answer, it doesn't, but I'm gonna actually talk a little bit about, uh, about this because we have these issues about uh, how it works, uh, what are the uh, uh, side effects uh, uh, of alternatives and, uh, and so forth. The second issue that I, that, that I believe relates uh, crucially to, to current monetary policy is uh, does the zero lower bound in conjunction with uh, very low uh, natural rates of interest, the environment we have right now, providing justification for the monetary authority to stop being systematic and start uh, always claiming, well, we need more flexibility uh, to do what we want. We cannot be tied down to anything. It would be dangerous because we see that we are in uncharted territory, so we, we need more room to maneuver. This is my interpretation of, uh, of the cause for the, uh, uh, for the monetary policy mistake that I think is, is already being made uh, this, uh, this time. Uh, uh, Mike and, uh, and Marvin already mentioned uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, how the Fed is behind the curve, and, and I agree with that. But I attribute that to the fact that uh, the uh, uh, unusual environment of the last several years and the presence of uncertainty is being used as an excuse to stop being systematic. I think this is what we need to, uh, to tackle. So first of all, uh, let me spend a few minutes on, uh, on, uh, on the history. Uh, I'm not a historian, you know, Mike is a historian here, but, but as a, um, um, uh, as a uh, central banking uh, uh, student, uh, I have found that uh, we need to absolutely go back to history to understand some of the, uh, some of the, basic, uh, some of the basic issues. So is the zero alert bound a limit to, uh, to, uh, to monetary policy? And I already said no. Um, we, I think we know by now that uh, balance sheet policies are incredibly effect effective. I think this is something that for those uh, who uh, had any doubts uh, uh, when this thing started in 2008, 2009, there can be no doubt about the effectiveness, the power, the immense power of, uh, uh, of, of a central bank's uh, balance sheet. I think we've only seen a little bit of that, of that power, 
There is a concern that there are side effects to balance sheet policies, uh, but I would claim uh, there are side effects to any monetary policy. There is a concern that uh, if the Federal Reserve uh, uses uh, the expansion of its balance sheet to expand the economy and, uh, and do counter-cyclical policy, the multipliers are uncertain. So you may do too little, you may do too much. But that's exactly the same thing I remember was the case with normal monetary policy. There was uncertainty about uh, whether you needed 100 basis points or 200 basis points to, uh, to fight uh, uh, a recession uh, or, um, uh, or, or a boom. Um, uh, there is a concern, Marvin, Marvin mentioned this before, that, uh, that uh, uh, balance sheet policies uh, have characteristics that are very similar to fiscal policy. Yeah, that's true. What's wrong with that? It's monetary policy that does have, in general equilibrium, consequences for everything else. But uh, yeah, uh, monetary policy always has fiscal consequences. It's only a matter of degree about uh, whether we focus on that uh, as the most important element uh, or the least important element. Uh, raising interest rates, uh, for example, uh, uh, raises the cost of financing for the, uh, uh, for the government. You have to check what is the intertemporal dynamics there. Are you raising the real interest rate uh, now? Uh, are you reducing it in the future? But any monetary policy uh, has fiscal implications and changes the intertemporal dynamics of what of what governments need to do. So uh, I'm not really concerned about the fact that balance sheet policies uh, uh, are even more fiscal than uh, than other policies. So I see balance sheet policies as uh, um, as a very powerful instrument uh, that can be used and should be used given the current architecture we have. Maybe 300 years from now. Uh, we're going to have a different environment where the side effects of balance sheet policies uh, uh, will, uh, will uh, outweigh uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the benefits. But, but right now, I don't, I don't really see them. And in a historical perspective, um, even though uh, for so many years, 2008, 9, 10, 11, um, so many people were calling uh, the Fed's uh, expansion of the balance sheet unprecedented, actually it wasn't. If you, uh, if you go uh, back long enough, uh, you can see that the uh, size of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve as a fraction of, uh, of GDP uh, only reached the 1940s level uh, in, uh, at the very end of, of QE3 uh, in, in 2015. Up to 2015, the balance sheet wasn't really particularly large compared to other historical episodes uh, uh, in the history of the, uh, of the Federal Reserve. Um, and yeah, we had other historical episodes. We had uh, the whole 30s, uh, most of the 30s and the, uh, and, and the 40s with, uh, with interest rates very low to, uh, to zero. Mike pointed out before, you have to go back, you check the 50s and 60s and you say uh, the interest rates, uh, exposed interest rates were negative for many years. These were serious distortions, but it's not as if we haven't seen distortions before, and this is the, uh, this is the first time. What's wrong with using balance sheet policy? I think uh, the, the one big lesson from the 1930s is that uh, you shouldn't be afraid, and you should actually go for it in order to limit and damage. So uh, if, if anything, the lesson is that uh, balance sheet policy <coughs> should be used forcefully early. This uh, would be expected to uh, uh, restore uh, uh, economic health and, uh, and allow a return to normalcy faster. Um, I can actually talk about comparisons uh, in cases here. If I compare what the Fed has been doing uh, in the last uh, several years with, with what the ECB has been doing, this comes out very clearly. Uh, the Fed acted more forcefully and earlier uh, at the Fed, I believe we're beyond full employment and we, have, we are back to price stability. Even the FOMC's projections are, uh, are at price stability, 2% uh, PC in a couple of years, uh, which means 2.5% uh, on the consumer price index. Let's not forget these things. This is not an environment with, uh, with low inflation. 
if you look at the other side of the Atlantic, the, uh, uh, the, the ECB unfortunately was uh, very reluctant to, uh, to expand its balance sheet, uh, and they are still in trouble. And the unemployment rate is still in, in double digits, uh, and uh, uh, inflation is, uh, uh, is about a percentage point or more below uh, where, the, where it should be. So in terms of the history, we should not worry about using uh, the balance sheet, uh, and we have that, uh, uh, that tool that's available. Um, <coughs> the second issue is uh, should we see the current environment of the zero layer bound and, uh, 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 and uh, uncertainty about the natural uh, rate of interest and the very low natural rate of interest, even if we accept uh, the, uh, some of the estimates that, that currently put it at zero, which you know, those are not my baseline estimates, but even if you accept these things, uh, is this an excuse for policy to become less systematic uh, and you know, give more leeway uh, to, the, um, uh, to the Fed to, to be looking at everything. You know, every day there is some variable um, that, that one can look at uh, and, and justify inaction uh, as, uh, as a result. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's not the case. Uh, I think the challenge, if we are talking about the challenge of operating in this environment, is to figure out what policy rule uh, the monetary authority should be, should be relying on that is robust to our ignorance of, uh, of the natural rate of interest and which can be robust to even episodes like the one we have right now where the, the natural rate of interest may be, uh, may be too low and the, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, nominal uh, rate is, uh, is very close to, uh, to zero. Well, that's a challenge. But I think, I think as, as, uh, as, as modelers, those who are doing macroeconomic modeling, uh, we know how to handle these things. You can actually devise uh, robust, systematic rules that deliver over time good outcomes uh, when it comes to achieving and maintaining price stability and full employment, even if you do not know the, uh, uh, the various natural rates. And uh, this, uh, you may not know what the natural rate of interest is, you may not know what the natural rate of unemployment is. The other one that, uh, that was related to the announcement we had, uh, we had this, this, this morning, for example. That's okay. I think there what we need to do is be careful in, in how we describe rules and, and, and how the, uh, uh, the debate uh, about uh, simple rules has been used even by the, uh, even by the Federal Reserve. So I remember um, uh, Chair Yellen a couple of years ago was using the Taylor Rule um, to make the argument that policy was just perfect. Uh, but the Taylor rule has this peculiarity that it effectively said, it, ef it effectively asks the Federal Reserve to set the real rate of interest to be equal to the natural rate of interest plus some adjustment if inflation is above or below your target, if employment is above or below your target. And that gives you a very important degree of freedom if you say, hey, the natural rate of interest is uncertain. So let's say you don't want to raise rates. All you need to do is say, oh, I've, re I've revised my estimates of the natural rate of interest downward. Don't need to raise rates. So in, in footnotes to, uh, to the chair's speeches, you would see uh, references to estimates of the natural uh, uh, real rate of interest having declined from two to zero or, or whatever one needs. You know, this, is, this is basic algebra. I mean, if I give you a degree of freedom like that, you can always find some estimate of the natural rate of interest that can justify not doing anything to, uh, to policy rates. But of course, we know there are, there are alternatives, and, and I want to spend uh, a couple of minutes discussing the uh, Vixelian alternative. Um, uh, Knut Vixel, who, uh, who was the, uh, the economist who defined the concept of the, of the natural rate of interest in the, at the end of the 19th century, after um, going through the definition of what the natural rate is, he, he had a, a beautiful short chapter on policy. And he asked the question, uh, do you need to estimate the natural rate of interest before you formulate policy? He said, no, that's actually, that, that, that doesn't make any sense. We, we don't know it, that would be impractical, impracticable, it's uncertain. You don't need to do that. 
All you need to do from a policy perspective is see whether prices are rising or prices are falling. If prices are rising, tighten policy. If prices are falling, is policy. You don't need to be making excuses about what the natural rate of interest is to do this. Now, at the end of the 19th century, he formulated that as raise the nominal interest rate uh, if, uh, uh, if prices are, are rising, cut the, real in, cut the nominal interest rate if prices are falling. That's a very, very simple prescription. You do not need to know what the natural real rate is to do this. But you do have the issue we have right now of how do you deal with a zero lower bound. And I'm going to end by pointing out the fact that we could be doing the same thing. We could be following a Vixellian rule, following systematic policy with the size of the balance sheet. And the policy that was not followed uh, by the Federal Reserve that I believe should be followed uh, if we were to have, uh, uh, to have the need uh, for, for big adjustments going forward is to specify what is the simple rule on the size of the balance sheet, meaning by how much do you raise the balance sheet if, uh, uh, if you see uh, inflation falling by, uh, by 50 basis points. And we can have a simple rule that will be very similar to the simple rule that, uh, that Vixel had postulated at the end of the 19th century, which we know from, uh, from, uh, from macroeconometric modeling uh, is very, very robust. The point is, we already know how to handle these things. Yes, there are side effects. What is important going forward uh, is to ensure that uh, we push for central banks to be honest and not use the excuse of uncertainty to avoid being systematic, regardless of whether uh, we are facing the challenge of the zero lower bound, uh, regardless of, uh, of where the natural uh, real rate uh, uh, is. Uh, let me stop here. Hi, Athanasios. Uh, when you look at the calculation of the natural rate of interest from Wabak Williams, don't they have some kind of cyclical element to it? It doesn't seem to be the Wixellian natural rate, which uh, would be when resources are fully employed, which is the definition that Marvin gave. Uh, there's a lot more variation to their calculation, also other calculations coming from the Fed. And I just wonder if that, uh, including that cyclical element, uh, I think they might use a potential output. Uh, I, I don't remember their calculation. But in any event, there's a cyclical element to their calculation. And couldn't that stir up more of this uncertainty as to what the appropriate natural rate is? Uh, well, there is, in some definitions of, uh, of estimates of the natural rate, there is a cyclical element. But even in those definitions, um, you can ask the question, seeing through the cyclical ele elements, uh, what is the expected short-term interest rate at equilibrium in the economy, say, five, 10 years from now, and define that to be your long-term uh, concept uh, of the natural uh, rate of interest. So the way, uh, the way those estimates work in, in time series models usually is to allow for time variation in that. In, in Labach and Williams, they have a, uh, a random walk uh, element in that. So there is a lot of variation uh, in, that, uh, in that as well. But your question and the way I'm answering it uh, highlights one of the many uncertainties about what the heck do we mean with this thing and how do we measure it? And this is one of the reasons why I, I, I turn this around and I say, we need to recognize just how uh, fundamentally uncertain we are about these natural rates. Um, I, um, in, in the past, uh, uh, I, I came up with the analogy with astrology. And I don't think we want to be relying on the stars uh, and, and do astrology. I think we want to be a little bit more careful when we're designing monetary policy. So I would much rather focus attention on uh, designing robust policy rules that do not rely on things uh, we have such little knowledge about. Marvin wants to. Yeah. <coughs> I, I just wanted to reply to a couple of things that Athanasios said. First, I'm, I think it's a great debate to have. Uh, 
But I think it's a little unfair to say that my only policy alternative is available in 300 years. One of the main points I said was if you float the deposit price of currency, this policy is available virtually immediately. And, I, and, and that's the point I'd like to drive home. It, it's, it's not, if we're confronting doubling the size of the Fed's balance sheet versus unencumbering interest, but letting the deposit price of currency float, uh, God forbid if we get into a global recession in the next two years and the 10-year bond rate in the United States is 1.5%, uh, I think I would be happy to maybe at another SOMC meeting to debate that I'd rather let the deposit price of currency float than to double the size of the Fed's balance sheet. But I agree, this is the nub of the issue. This, and I'm glad we're debating it, and I'm proud to be a member of the SOMC talking about these things. Okay. And by the, by the way, I want to stress that I, f I support research along these lines. The question is, it's one thing to put the idea out. It's another thing to then have, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a couple dozen uh, uh, researchers work on what exactly are the implications of that for, for the financial industry and for, and for behavior by firms and households and so forth. And I think it's absolutely right. We should be discussing what are ways to go forward. <coughs> So that's not what I wanted to say. I, I took it for granted, though, that in 300 years this problem will be solved. So it's, it's a question of uh, how early you can solve it. Yeah. Hi. I'm not an economist, therefore my relatively naive question. Uh, when you talk about inflation, um, how do you take into consideration Wisconsin, the price of Wisconsin cheddar cheese, um, French wine, the price of Amazon.com stock, and the um, government spending, i.e. the relationship between the budget and the GDP. Okay, so the, um, uh, I'm a very simple-minded economist, uh, so I would say that I would, I would try to measure the inflation of, uh, of goods and services that we currently consume. So um, uh, stocks uh, should not be included in the, uh, uh, in the calculation of how we measure current, uh, uh, current inflation. Uh, French wine, it depends if you are holding it for consumption in 20 years, so then I wouldn't count it. But if you are consuming it now, then I would, I would, uh, I would count uh, its, its price. Uh, so really what, what I have in mind is, uh, and, th and there are many, many, many difficult issues, but uh, I, th I think the CPI, is, uh, CPI inflation is, uh, is, is a good measure of inflation, which is uh, the general increase of the price level for, for what we consume as, uh, uh, as, uh, as households. There are many measurement issues associated with and I should have to say that each one of us faces a different inflation rate, depending on, on the basket of goods we, uh, we consume. From, from the macro side and from the Fed's perspective, I wouldn't want the Fed to be focusing on any particular uh, uh, sector of the, uh, uh, of the economy. So the question is just have the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics try to come up with uh, what is a, a good measure for, uh, for inflation uh, and, and have the Fed stabilize that. And of course, we know that because of the volatility in some components, uh, 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 we may get signals on inflation that are very misleading. Uh, oil prices have been, have been messing up uh, the uh, uh, headline inflation statistics in, uh, in, in recent years. This is why it's important to do research, uh, for example, the research that's done at the, uh, at the Cleveland Fed about how do you measure uh, inflation indices that will be, uh, give you a, a better measurement of the underlying inflation rate and not be as volatile. So you have the median CPI measure, for example, three mean CPI and so forth. Hi. Uh Thanks uh, for two great presentations, though I, I would say I'm, a, I'm slightly concerned that uh, this group is discussing uh, for, uh, ways to have easier monetary policy. I, uh, I hope we can talk <coughs> about, a print, uh, you know, perhaps uh, that monetary policy might be a little too easy currently, uh, and that uh, sort of, uh, well, just one initial point is, uh, which I don't sort of, uh, 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 I don't really understand is, you know, if you look at inflation measures, for instance, uh, uh, there's an inflation measure produced by President Mester's Cleveland Fed that's <coughs> quite high. Uh, I think it's probably about at least as high as the average of the mid-90s and the 2000s. Uh, I think if you look at even core PCE, which, the, which is the lowest uh, sort of core measure, it's, it's probably around the average of where it was in the mid-90s and the 2000s. So it's not 
inflation's not not that low. Um, and then I, I uh, which so, so I, I wondered what you you know the the panel had to, to say about that with respect to you know sort of looking into the future and thinking about uh, sort of the the longer term uh, you know real rate of interest um, and, and just sorry to, to I don't mean to give a speech I do have a question. Um, <laughs> also, if you factor in population growth, I don't know if the Fed or you know ever looks at uh, uh, per capita GDP growth. It's something that boggles my mind because, of course, um, you know, we, the, if if we did that, we'd know that Japan has done better than any country um, uh, <laughs> has done better than Europe or the U.S. Yet they're cited as an example of something something to avoid. Um, but g going just just uh, Marvin had mentioned his critique, his his explanation for why he thought inflation was low and growth was low, which is that there's a debt overhang. So I. When, if, if, if that's true, if that's something that, that other uh, people agree with, um, uh, does that mean that we should be looking to, to say that uh, there's a policy mistake because inflation is going to be too high if the Fed leaves interest rates low? Or in fact, there's some other problem, uh, 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 you know, perhaps like looking at what President Rosengren has said, that there's a financial stability problem. It's not in fact that inflation is going to be too high, but that there's a debt overhang we're encouraging more of a debt overhang by low interest rates, and we should be sort of framing the debate in a different way about monetary policy normalization, not that inflation is going to overshoot if rates are left too low. So thank you. Okay, that's, that's, that's a series of, uh, uh, of questions. Um, uh, and I, I, will try to, I, I will try to address uh, uh, a, a couple of them. First, um, I try to draw a very strong distinction between uh, supply and demand and potential supply and potential supply as a matter of principle, I think uh, uh, monetary policy should take as given um, and, and not try to believe it can influence and so forth. So I think right now we, uh, we can be uh, sad that uh, trend productivity is lower than it used to be. Potential output growth is lower than it used to be. But I don't think that's the Fed's job to fix it there. I would actually echo some of the elements that, uh, that, that Marvin brought up government policies uh, are a very important uh, factor for determining uh, uh, long-term growth uh, in, a, in an economy, uncertainty about the tax system and regulation, for example, uh, have a negative effect on longer-term growth. So that's a problem. These are the factors uh, that, that drive growth uh, lower. Uh, but whatever, that, whatever the supply is, the issue with, uh, with, uh, with monetary policy, uh, in, uh, in my view, would be to stabilize uh, uh, prices. Now, you're right, uh, some, some inflation measures are, uh, are high. Uh, Cleveland Fed's median CPI is at 2.6%, which translates to about 2.1% PC in basis. I believe uh, that the policy is behind the curve uh, uh, in light of the fact that we are at full employment and, uh, and those inflation measures are too high. And, and I also agree with, uh, with the statement that even the uh, core PCE measures are not that low uh, as, to, uh, uh, as to justify uh, why uh, policy hasn't been moving. Thanks. I think we're going to change gears and have a new panel come up. Thank you.